in this video, I want to expand on the concept of the new world order that I've presented in other videos and specifically how a new world order is upon us, but we have the capability to participate in creating a new world order for ourselves, our descendants, our community that represents the world that we would like to see, the order in the world that we would like to see or at least the order in the world that is emerged from some degree of revelation. And that's what I want to talk about. An order that is liberating in the proper way and not enslaving, because certainly what is being presented to us from multiple angles, multiple belligerents in this war for values in the world, not, not every side, is where we would want to be. And as a matter of fact, the major belligerents are both essentially versions of the same essential slavery system. And so many of us would prefer to not go on one side or the other, because as we have seen in so many other conflicts, I mean, we had the Nazis fighting the Bolsheviks, right? I don't think you want either Hitler or Stalin. It's not an either or. It's not choosing the lesser of two evils. And that's certainly what we are being faced with today. And so I think that there's a great trap in just because one of these presented new world orders is maybe it's the one that you're in. Maybe it's the one that you're seeing somewhere else. And you say, I don't want that. So you gravitate toward the next option that's being presented to you. I think there's a huge trap in that. What I specifically want to talk about, since there are many aspects of a new world order, but my particular bent, the thing that I think about often is digital currency and associated with that, digital identity. So both money and identity are topics that I've been speaking in public about and teaching about for years and value transfer networks. This is something that I have studied extensively, both the history of it and what's currently out there and what's coming. And I've done my best to share that with you. So what I want to talk about and to answer a question that does come up regularly in my conversations with people about these topics, I want to answer why our new world order, as far as I can see, when we talk about the financial new world order, which is what a lot of this struggle is, is about, a new financial paradigm, why it must be Bitcoin. Why it must be Bitcoin. There are many people who even see and have a description that, yes, a new financial world order is being imposed upon the world in several different flavors, as it were, but they're not sold on Bitcoin. I think most of these people don't actually have a firm grasp on what Bitcoin is. They see a, a representation, let's say in popular media and social media, what the voices who are saying Bitcoin, they look at those people and say, eh, I, mm, yeah, I don't really, vibe with those people. They don't resonate with me. I don't think that those are necessarily good people. And I would tend to agree. As someone who is speaking about Bitcoin, I would tend to agree. And I would also say that most of those people actually, that who they're thinking of, maybe they even see them on CNBC or whatever, most of those people actually have no clue what Bitcoin is. And I, I know this. I mean, I teach a school with what Bitcoin actually is, Bitcoin Mystery School. People get to get a hands-on feel for the actual aspects of Bitcoin and almost to a person, they walk out of that class. And again, don't need to take my word for it. They get to feel it themselves. They get to experience the actual mechanisms that are running Bitcoin and see it down to a, a granular level. And 201, they walk out saying, I had no idea. I had no, I walked into this. I had no idea that that's what that this is what Bitcoin is. And then the next question that they say is, why is, does nobody else know? Like, I've watched all these podcasts I've, or, or listened to these podcasts. I've watched all these YouTube videos. These people don't know. They're bringing up names of people and they're like, but they don't even, it's like they don't even know. And that's actually very, very important. 
So the message that I'm pushing forward is one about Bitcoin as it actually exists. Now, one of the things that you should know up front is that those who are trying to bring in the new world order, at least the ones who are building the systems, know what Bitcoin is at a very deep level. As a matter of fact, and I've covered this before, you could go through my YouTube channel or back through my Twitter posts. The U.S. central bank digital currency for the Federal Reserve, it's called Project Hamilton, was developed by top Bitcoin developers. One in particular's name is even on the white paper as an author, Corey Field, who you can go and look at the contributions. He's a top 10 contributor to Bitcoin Core, the main node reference implementation for BTC that's actually been forked for all of the other Bitcoin chains. And for many non-Bitcoin chains, right? They'll fork the code, change the name, so we're talking everything from Litecoin to Dash. Uh, these, are, these are forks of Bitcoin and forks of that code. And so a long, long time contributors of that participated in building what is the US central bank digital currency, a slavery system that looks very much like Bitcoin, very much like it. Uh, I've talked about this in videos uh, there you can, look for, and I'll put them in the description of this uh, on YouTube, and also Tobias Rook and Amari Sachet have done some great videos on this, and they've been sort of making the rounds. So if you want to know more about this, that's definitely something to look at. And yet it's another reason why, and I'll discuss in just a second, a, a, another aspect of the reason why our new world order must be Bitcoin. If those seeking to enslave us have realized what a wonderful tool it is, and a powerful tool it is, and a weapon against you, why would you deny yourself the use of the weapon that your enemy is going to use against you? That's just not simply a good plan, especially if you have access to it right now, essentially for free, it's there. Why would you not take advantage of that? So let's talk about where other people are going who may be seeing the same idea. They may be seeing that, yes, a new world order is upon us. And uh, yes, we need to have some sort of solution to it. And they are coming up with solutions that they think would be adequate. And so I want to talk about, let's say, why those solutions are inadequate, but why Bitcoin is adequate, and it's really in three parts. The first has to do with uh, revelation. The second has to do with limitations and the value uh, of limitations. And the third has to do with narration. It has to do with a story, narrative. So let's talk about Revelation. This is something that I used to call evolution when I was thinking about human systems, human understanding, human thought. I used to call this evolution. And I think that it's something that a lot of materialists will call evolution. I'm having a better understanding of this over the last two to three years, that it is less about evolution and more about revelation of what a thing is meant to be. So we start with a kind of a rough sketch of a thought, an idea, with a little bit of revelation. And maybe it's something like looking through a dirty glass, right? Dirty window, a very dirty window at something, and we see it. And then we sort of create it rough here on this side of the window. And as the generations go on and go on, it's not that we ourselves somehow evolve this thing. It's that a succession of individuals looking at the thing, but also attempting to clean the window to get more clarity. And this is really what we're pre presented with as we start to use it and there start to be problems. There start to be problems in a certain area of it. And we say, ah, oh, well, this, 
this problem shouldn't be here. This is the feeling that we have about it. This problem shouldn't be here. What have I done wrong in the way that I've constructed this? And the way that we see uh, sort of what we've done wrong or what we're missing is we start cleaning the glass. We get it more and more clean until we can see, oh, 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 I see. I put this wrong. Okay, I see what it was supposed to be. This has really been made clear to me over the past year almost now. After a, uh, a Russian priest on a mission, one of the rare, let's say, Russian mission priests, uh, he, he has a, uh, a parish, a Metokion in Taiwan. He, I, I would say almost magically, but it was providentially appeared here on Saipan, actually last July 4th, and was here. It was pretty incredible, did some services with us, the, the, the faithful here, the, the few Orthodox who were here. I had just recently, it had only been about a month or so since I had been baptized and chrismated Orthodox. So it was one of these incredible experiences. Uh, no Russian priest had been here for like 200 years. He had the church records. So he was here. And since that time, he has been instructing myself and some of the other brothers who are here in a lot of the history of the Orthodox Church, particularly focusing on the ancient church and how practices have been, how revelation through revelation, we've gone from the ancient church practices to the practices of today. And that in each time, the revelation was to solve a problem. And so it's the, it's the living the life of the Holy Spirit being more and more revealed. It's a much better description, especially for me as a, an engineer, as a developer, as I've watched my own thought process, as I develop things and as I iterate through them, it is much less about some sort of evolutionary process and much more about something's not working. I move away from it, meditation, prayer, contemplation, conversation with others, and then, aha, sometimes in the middle of the night, wake up, you know, four in the morning. Oh, that's the answer. And go and sit down. And yes, there it was. It is much more about revelation. And I think that people who have these sorts of experience will, will, experiences will understand that. And as we look at Bitcoin, as I've played a role and been around and been witness to how Bitcoin has grown, how it has changed, how problems are fixed, writ large, it is very much about revelation. Bitcoin began as a revelation, Satoshi Nakamoto, and it has changed over time and become what it is from people actually using it, building on it, and seeing, I can't do this, and this is an important thing that I need to do. And to make changes in the code that would enable that, it's an incredibly long, arduous process that relies a lot upon revelation. And the big changes in code have seemed like revelation to where somebody, it's an aha moment, something elegant, something relatively simple, but why didn't we think of this before? And, oh, we can do this. That sort of change is, is very, very important. And that sort of energy about this thing is very important because it tells us that it has the ability to change to meet the current situations. In some ways, we can look at the past and we can have a certain degree of faith that, well, we look at the past and we look at what it was and we say, well, this problem came along and it, the challenge was met. This problem came along and the challenge was met. Not easily, not with ease sometimes with schisms, but the challenge is met and the project is able to move forward and to meet its purpose. And that's gonna be very important as we move forward because it's, we're facing brand new challenges, brand new challenges. Also important about this is that there is a current state of it. And that current state is in reaction to the world. This is very much like the church as well. It is in reaction to the world. And so this is an argument against those individuals who say, yes, a new financial system is coming. 
a uh, new financial, new world order, an enslavement system. But the people who would say, so therefore we must go back to the old things that we have already moved past. Because that is in many ways a denial of revelation. Like we are at Visa, we are at the Visa network, which by the way, a lot of that is a revelation and by a single man that most people don't know about by the name of D. Hawk, D-E-E -E is his first name, H-O-C-K is the last name. He even wrote uh, it's kind of an autobiography of how he came up with the Visa Network, a very spiritually minded guy, very philosophical. You probably have never heard of him. One of the most important people in the history of finance. Visa Network, all the credit card networks would not exist were it not for him. For, for him and a very deep thinker on these things. His, uh, the book that I'm referencing is called One From Many, The Story of Visa, uh, written by the guy who basically came up with the idea, for the most part, of how the current Visa network operates. Again, Revelation. You read that book and you see immediately, ah, this is Revelation. And it's because problem, there were problems with the way that things were, whether that was checks, and checks were solving a problem of paper, currency and paper currency was solving a problem of coins and coins were solving a problem of just weights of metals, et cetera, et cetera. So the people who say, oh, just go back to using cash. That's not, you can't compete and you can't survive because what's being presented as the alternative, the central bank digital currency is degrees of revelation forward. And part of its legacy, its history, even if you look at all of the central bank digital currencies that are being presented, you can trace them all back to Bitcoin. Think about that. Whether they're on blockchains based on like hyperledger fabric, whether they're a, a new sort of system that's, in, that's come up with like Project Hamilton, Bitcoin is in all of them. As a matter of fact, if you read the white papers of the system, you will see the word Bitcoin mentioned. That's important because those systems themselves are riding on the revelation. It's not a move backwards. And anyway, to move backwards, to move backwards, we run into this Chesterton Spence idea. This was also presented to me, literally had a conversation with uh, Father Kirill last night about this as he was talking about the ancient practices. Chesterton's fence is. Uh, G.K. Chesterton, this famous little idea that he comes up with, this thought experiment where he says uh, he's walking through a field, and in the middle of the field, there's a fence. With it, he's walking with a companion. There's a fence that looks like it leads to nothing. It's blocking nothing. It's just sitting there. And his companion says, we should remove the fence. Let's just take the fence up. And Chesterton says, no, you will not remove the fence. The only way that I will allow you to remove the fence is if you can explain to me why the fence is there in the first place. Until you can do that, you may not remove the fence. And this is crucially important. It's important for all of the individuals who look at the current situation and say, oh, the solution is to go back to a previous time. It's particularly dangerous when it's, we should go back to a previous way of being that this person has never experienced. Like, oh, it was better then, a time that they have not even experienced. That's the fence. Like, let's take down what is currently here because it doesn't make sense to me why it is here. And so Father Kirill had said to me when I asked him, well, is, it, is the church against, for instance, these ancient practices? Are these still valid? I mean, they're part of the church history. Are they valid? And he said, it's not, it's not a matter of whether they're valid or not. I mean, they could be used if there was a blessing, for instance, from the bishop or whatnot. But he said, even if you wanted to begin to go back to the ancient practices, and my own spiritual father has, has said something similar about not leapfrogging saints. He says, you, you need to understand the current, everything about the current practice, because it's all there. Before you would even take one step backwards, you need to understand everything in the present because you need to understand and then take one step back and say, ah, that's why they added this. And maybe you just decide, yep, that was a good decision. It's a revelation of the Holy Spirit.
it's important. So those people who say, well, just use cash, just use physical cash. That's going to be gone. How do we know that's going to be gone? Because look, it already went away on its own. And what you're going to convince people to go back to something that generations of people thought the, new, the, the way of doing it now is better than that? Never mind going back to coins. Well, then we've got to go back to metal backed paper. And then we're going to go back to coins. And then even the crazies who are like, yeah, we should really what we've got to do is we've just got to go back to weights of metal. Which like forget all of the things that people like about the world that we're in. And even those who are righteous, we would want to be able to connect communities. That's important. And we would want to be able to connect them over communications channels. And this is what Bitcoin represents. It's very important. If you go and you read the white, white paper and you go and you read the introduction, even Satoshi Nakamoto says, yeah, physical currency, not against it. In the introduction to the white paper, it says everything that Bitcoin solves, it can be solved with physical currency. Right? The payment costs, the lack of trust, all of that but it can't be done over a communications channel. This is the new revelation. Very important. So if we're going to have our new world order, it's got to be, it's got to have at least the capabilities of the other world orders that are being presented. That's the first thing. That's revelation. The next is limitation. And this is the reason why it's not gonna be crypto. It's not gonna be Ethereum and all of the things that just do what Ethereum does better many of which even have the Ethereum virtual machine in them. So all of these different smart contract blockchains. And the reason for this is, well, we could see why does Ethereum exist at all? If you go and you read the Ethereum white paper, you go and you look at the talk where Vitalik introduces Ethereum, what's very, very clear is that this 19-year-old, a very brilliant 19-year-old, but still a 19 year old, like no matter how brilliant you are, you're not wise at 19. And his problem with Bitcoin is its limitations. He says, there's a whole suite of things that we potentially could do with the blockchain that are very difficult to do with Bitcoin or impossible because there are things that would need to be added to Bitcoin and that would require quite a bit of let's say, political will and time to get it done. And he's 19 <laughs> and he can build something. So why wait? Let me build it. And we see what the result of that is. If you look at the scams, the hacks, the losses of funds, people's bank accounts being emptied out, people being arrested for, for you know, SEC violations and all of that. If you look at that over, let's say, the last eight to 10 years, it's almost exclusively, almost exclusively on Ethereum and next to none of it has to do with Bitcoin. And you look at all of the things that I myself have talked about in terms of people missing the mark from DeFi to NFTs, the, the greed, the avarice, the sloth all of the play on the passions, all of the people who are what they call, even call themselves degenerates. It's all taking place on Ethereum. Many of these ideas like NFTs, stable coins, they began on BTC. They began on Bitcoin. But for some reason, the, 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 the wickedness, the play to the passions, the missing of the mark, that it was unable to take hold on Bitcoin. And I believe that a lot of that is due to Bitcoin's limitations. It's specifically meant to be a, a system with great amounts of limitation. Where things can be done, but they have to really be thought about. And the people who would be even able to do it, the reason that they're able to do it is because they have spent a lot of time and put in the work working on the system. So in many cases, a lot of those people would decide, eh, I don't really want to do that. It's not a get rich quick thing that's simple for developers to learn, which is exactly what Vitalik built with Ethereum. 
that even somebody who hasn't spent a lot of time with Ethereum can make these smart contracts that play into just the worst aspects of human nature, just pure greed. And I've seen it time and time and time again. So I'm talking with somebody and it's just like, it's pure greed. Oh, yeah, I'm going to make a Ponzi scheme. And it's like, and it's like, that's a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, but yeah. And if you can do it, it will be done. All of the things that can't be done on Bitcoin. So there is this kind of intangible aspect of it. That the, the, the corruption, the, the, the fact that it would become corrupt was built in from the beginning. Because even if you look at the things that are being suggested that can be done on Ethereum, when Vitalik is introducing it, you see immediately that like, yeah, unscrupulous people are going to use this and they have, and they have. It is Bitcoin's limitations that make it so powerful. And part of that, part of that power is the power to keep out a lot of BS. It's the power to keep out a lot of the things that Ethereum lets right in by its nature. In the white paper, Satoshi Nakamoto in the conclusion says, the system is robust in its unstructured simplicity. It's simple. Its simplicity makes it incredibly secure. There's not a lot of moving parts. And you can do interesting, interesting things, but it requires a lot of thought and it requires significant experience to do it right. And that's exactly what you want in a system that's going to be providing for generations and generations of people a, a financial sovereignty. You want the people who can muck around with it. You want a, a high degree of competency required before you can make anything work. It doesn't, you, you can build, clearly, you can build all kinds of terrible smart contracts that are either buggy on purpose or by accident that allow people to have their funds stolen on Ethereum without a doubt, because those hacks happen every day. On Bitcoin, not, not easy to do due to the limitations. Again, very important. The next narration, story. Bitcoin alone, out of all of the other cryptocurrencies, by nature of it being basically the first, the first that began the revolution, it has a story like none other. It has a story that, that has echoes of the great stories, echoes of the great narratives of the past, of the legends of the past. It has a legendary story of an unknown pseudonymous character who appears out of nowhere and presents this powerful thing that at first is not really accepted by too many people. But then after this person has vanished, vanished, that it's picked up and it becomes a global phenomenon and that this person devoted so much work into it and that they are left with treasures. It's basically Satoshi's treasure that only Satoshi himself could come back and claim. And yet it is very likely that it will remain unclaimed in my opinion. I think that's a feature. There's also the aspect that of all of the currencies, it's been important enough that there have been these forks, there have been these schisms where each of the pieces of these forks make a claim to being the true Bitcoin. And on any of the, these, Satoshi Nakamoto could actually come back and claim his treasure. This is only true with Bitcoin. There is a fork of Ethereum from when they had a, well, the DAO hack, to go back to write the hacks. And at that time, early on, there were some people who were really, they still had the ethos of Bitcoin and they, that was Ethereum Classic, but no one cares about ETC. No one really cares about Ethereum Classic. And there have not been significant wars fought over that. There aren't people with a, a almost religious devotion, which you really see in, in forks like BSV, Bitcoin Satoshi, Satoshi Vision. 
it's fundamentally like it's got the dynamics of a cult and it always has and various different leaders and wars that have been fought and in that regard it has that same narrative let's say of who is the true heir to the legacy of satoshi and we see this in organizational structures that have traveled through time and that have been adopted en masse, whether that's Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Islam, Shia, Sunni, and go down the list, all, the, all with a claim to, let's say, the true legacy. We don't see that. We don't see that story existing with any of the other coins. And that's really important. It's very important because human beings base our value system on story. We base our value system on story. Right? So that's how we know what's valuable is tell me the story about the thing, the provenance. It's why at a historical site, they'll put up a little placard and you'll read, oh, this was where such and such and such happened. And now you have a new appreciation for the site. Only Bitcoin has this. And not many systems, not many tools, not many aspects of human knowledge have such a thing, have the story to go along with it. That's absolutely crucial as we build. It's absolutely crucial because it becomes the connective tissue around which disparate communities that are, are all over the world are able to view themselves with one identity and to participate. And this is how you can have the type of network effect that's going to be needed to have this new world order, to have something bubble from underneath in many different places. The history of Christianity has this embedded in it from the start. The epistles of St. Paul are addressed to the various different churches around the Mediterranean. There's a connective tissue. Bitcoin has all of this. It has all of this. It's, it comes out of this revelation slash evolution. It has the necessary limitations to keep out some of the worst elements of corruption. And it also allows for a narration. It allows for the story about it to be told and its value to be transmitted. It's value as a network, it's value as a system, it's value as a phenomenon and a tool to be transmitted through generations that others would take it on as something valuable. Not just something to get rich, something that matters. This is what we have. This is the tool that we have we can begin building on it at any time. So those of you who'd like to build with me, just my invitation. I'd love to see you. Bitcoin Mystery School, bitcoinmysteryschool.com. The more the merrier. I'd like you to understand these things at a much deeper level. I'd like you to understand them more as just pretty words, but really as a, as, as a deep call to action and to be able to participate in making the new world order with your own mind and your own hands with communities of like-minded people who want to do so.